Okay. Hi, folks. My name is Joe Farrow. I work with Uber. I'm on the Jaeger team. Uh, I work on the front end, so I'm focused mostly on analysis of traces. And today we're going to be talking about gaining insights from distributed traces. Uh, okay, so I see distributed traces as a very awesome and rich source of data. Uh, it's unlike local profiling or local tracing, it's not that dense. You don't get like, you know, super granular stuff about your local processes, but it is very rich in terms of the insights it can give you about your distributed system. Uh, and actually, like any given trace is a footprint of a transaction, as Ross talked about. And then if we take multiple traces, we can really start to do some interesting stuff. Uh, but uh, if we collect these distributed traces and we don't use them, then we're basically squandering our investment and the loss is twofold. Uh, we lose what we, the energy and the time and the work we put into collecting the traces, instrumenting our system, storing the traces, and we also lose all of the potential benefits. The benefits are pretty, potentially pretty massive, uh, and I kind of equate this to being a farmer that is growing crops and not harvest them. Uh, so it's kind of sad, but uh, you know, you know, it's a progression. So the loss opportunities include uh, improving performance and reliability, more efficiently uh, addressing tech debt, more effective planning and collaboration, and also managing system complexity because it gains us insight into these things, um, uh, offers insight into these things. And this is just like a very brief kind of uh, review of what we can get out of traces. Uh, so today we're going to talk about a selection of analysis techniques or just kind of a handful to kind of give us a sense of what's out there. We're going to talk about how we can use multiple analysis uh, uh, in a given uh, time frame, how we can go from one to another. We're going to go through some use cases for illustrating going from uh, one form of analysis to another. And then we're going to talk about how this can pay off. So uh, a wide range of analysis techniques are available, uh, like a very wide range, like the tracing uh, and uh, traces are sort of really kind of involved. And so we can kind of like focus on any subsection of it, or we can aggregate them in really interesting ways. So there's really kind of a wide range. Uh, today we're going to focus on human-centric uh, benefits, so we're going to try to help people make decisions, help them do their job more effectively as opposed to automated analysis, which is uh, kind of hands-off. You kind of set it up and, and hopefully it works right. Um, and so we're going to go through three main types, and this is just a sample. And also this is kind of oriented towards Jaeger, uh, but it's also a lot of this is not implemented in Jaeger. It's kind of like uh, future work. Okay. So the first thing we're gonna look at are Gantt charts. This is kind of like the tried and true representation of a trace. It's viewing one trace. On the left we have parent-child relationships uh, as indicated by indentation. Uh, and then on the right we have timing information. So there's horizontal bars. The wider the bar, the longer uh, the duration. And the positioning of the bar indicates sort of the, where it occurred in time. And then the indentation on the left indicates the parent-child relationships. And if we click on one of these rows, we can see the metadata that's associated with this span. So this is a way to view the raw data that's associated with a trace. It has some downsides uh, for very large traces, complex traces, it can be overwhelming. It can also be, uh, like it doesn't have any context. So you don't know if this is like an isolated trace or if this is representative of really what's typical in your system. So those are some of the downsides. One of the nice things about this view is we can look at the critical path. The critical path is designated by the spans that if we shorten their duration, we're going to shorten the duration of the trace itself. So this helps us focus optimization efforts. Uh, so that's kind of it for Gantt charts right now. Now we're going to look at node link diagrams. Uh, so this is an individual trace. Um, and so there's kind of a couple different ways that we can represent traces. Uh, in node link diagrams. We have some kind of decisions to make in terms of how granular we want to be. So here we have uh, like the color codings based on services. So you can see quite a few repeated colors. Uh, this is basically a pretty authentic representation of the trace itself, but we're collapsing similar nodes. So uh, if A calls B seven times, in this case, we're going to collapse B into one node and associate a count of seven with that. But if A calls B, which then calls C, right? That happens seven times or whatever. Then A calls B seven times. We're, in this view, we're differentiating the B that's a leaf node from the Bs that are parent nodes. So that's actually a wide spectrum. We can view this as um, every span has a node, which basically becomes kind of explosively complex. Uh, or we can kind of take it even further and represent any given service as just a single node. 
So this is with just one trace. So when we do this, we can also do it with groups of traces, which is um, something we'll see in a second. So with this view, trace as a diagram or a node link diagram, we can do comparisons between two traces. So here we have that representation where we're collapsing uh, repeated elements and we're comparing two traces. Uh, the color coding here is gray nodes are in both traces and they have the exact same count. Light green nodes are in both traces and there's more in trace B. Light red nodes are in both traces and there's fewer in trace B. And then the dark red and dark green nodes are missing completely in trace B for red nodes and only in trace B for dark green nodes. So this kind of gives us an idea of the structural differences between these two traces. So we'll notice that these are both, uh, these, they're post calls into EATS uh, gateway for generating orders. And the top half is largely gray with some kind of like light green and light pink stuff. Uh, so it's kind of similar. And then the bottom half diverges pretty, pretty severely. So what's going on here is the uh, two orders are uh, different in that the first order is fine and it gets created and it's, everything's fine. The second order, the person actually had a negative balance. And so they didn't have any money. So the, all the red that's not in B is completing the order and the green stuff that's in B and not in A is rolling back the order. So this is a way to differentiate sort of you know, differences in the fan out. Uh, so we can kind of stick with the node link diagrams and stick with the comparisons and take a look at comparing one trace to a aggregation of traces. So here we have a trace that we're comparing to an aggregation of traces and the aggregation uh, has more stuff than the trace. And so the dark gray nodes are elements that are in the aggregation that are not in the individual trace. And so this is a way to kind of see like what's not happening that you might consider typically would happen. And this is a uh, diagnostic tool for incidents. So what we've done is we've kind of uh, aggregated healthy stuff and uh, we compare something that we consider that might be unhealthy with it. So we can see the gaps in the call graph in the fan out. And also we emphasize nodes that have error data so right now, there's like some nodes in there that have a red outline. If you click on those, you get this panel to the right, which has error information, might have a stack trace, some error logs. So this surfaces error data. And it's also kind of nice in that, unlike the comparing two traces or looking at an individual trace, uh, this has quite a bit of context because we have an aggregation. So if we move on from this, we can look at something called a request path graph. This is uh, a view for many traces. We can, we can do this for one trace, but it'd be kind of pointless. Um, or actually, we kind of already do it's a trace graph, so it's not really this. Uh, so with this, we can group, uh, aggregate many traces, and what we're looking at are unique paths. So we can see here that A calls to F, and then A also calls B, which calls C, which calls F. The reason A is on there twice is because it has a direct connection to F, and then it also has a different pathway to F. So the reason uh, this is kind of interesting is because we can see kind of the, the variety of ways that things arrive at F and the variety of ways that F calls downstream. So it calls B downstream uh, twice in, in two different ways, one where B is a leaf node and one where B is a parent node. And so this is like a nice way to, to get a nuanced understanding of what's going on with a group of traces. If this is, uh, this can get kind of unwieldy really fast because we have A represented more than once, B represented more than once. So if we have a complex system, it's gonna be kind of crazy. So we also have the ability to uh, collapse these on, onto, uh, so that A will show up only once and B will show up only once. And this is a dependency graph where we have uh, any given service is represented once. We have a focal service. So we know that all paths represented in this graph go through this focal service. And we know that uh, within, this, within that restriction, any given service connects to these other services. Because service A is showing up only once, we know that anything that it's connected to is like the, the real kind of sum of the connections for uh, this graph. Whereas in the previous graph, we kind of have to keep track of like, oh, there's more than one A, that kind of thing. Okay, so um, the last uh, kind of category of views we're gonna look at are called attribute aggregations. So here we have, uh, we're taking in traces, we're processing spans, and we're generating trace quality scores. This is service focused, so we're interested in uh, generating a quality score for a particular service. And this is uh, kind of used to like drive policy and adherence to uh, instrumentation and, and that kind of stuff. But it can be kind of generalized, but it's mostly used as like a score. So people try to get their score up and that type of thing to promote uh, tracing adoption. Um, so there's this. 
And then we have uh, like a personal favorite, latency histograms. This is uh, based on span data. And so uh, we have kind of our latency histogram here. We can see it's multimodal. We can see there's like a kind of a long tail. In this particular screenshot, the tail has a subsection selected. That's the gray bar, the vertical gray bar that's kind of wider and, and not as dark. And from that section, we can see which uh, endpoints of the service are represented and also which upstreams are calling into that section. So we know uh, the long tail of this is affecting these particular services and it's hitting these particular endpoints on this service and this is kind of what's going on. Okay, so then we also have uh, some stuff from Pinterest. They have an aggregation system where they group traces and then look at kind of uh, aggregated statistics about the traces focused on duration and latency and uh, fan out, trying to capture drift, that kind of stuff. So they'll compare two, two uh, groups of traces, maybe by version or by date range, and look at the comparison. Um, then we have some stuff from the Canopy paper. Uh, the top one, uh, top section, A, is looking at uh, two particular versions of an uh, Android app and the functions that are called in those apps and how often or how many traces have that particular function and some latency information with the function. B is a sunburst diagram. So it has, uh, you know, this uh, function called these functions, or maybe it's downstream services, I don't know. Um, it didn't really go into details in the paper. But basically, it's looking at um, like cascading uh, information. So you have A is calling, fanning out into B, and B is taking up like X percent of A as latency. And then we have just a latency histogram for traces. So this is the uh, attribute aggregation. And so what we've looked at here is uh, a variety of uh, ways of visualizing. It's been kind of cursory and kind of quick. The idea is to understand that there's quite a bit of variety. And we should note that each of these has a distinct or distinctive strengths and weaknesses. Uh, like if we're looking at the Gantt chart, it's great for digging into something, but it doesn't tell us anything about the ecosystem as a whole. If we're looking at the dependency graph, then we're not going to get stack traces unless we service them, uh, even though that would be kind of not really scaling that well. Um, so what we can do is we can shore up the weaknesses of one view with the strengths of another. And the way we do that is, uh, by recognizing that we can use any view as a gateway into another view. So some examples of that. Uh, here on the trace quality metrics, we can look at the failures by the number one, and we can use that to go look at individual traces to see the problems as they manifest in our traces. Another example is here on the latency histogram, there's a section where if we highlight a subsection, we can then click this button and we can link to individual traces to dig into the details of why maybe they're slower. Uh, additionally, on this graph, we can select something from the performance section and something from the tail and compare these two with the trace comparison utilities, uh, either looking at structural differences or you know, other attributes can be used for the comparison. Additionally, we can select a subregion of the latency histogram to generate our mini aggregate and then compare something from the tail against that mini. So now we're looking at uh, having this feed into our other sort of one versus many uh, visualizations. For the diagrams, the path diagrams, we can go from one to the other. The top left is the uh, request path diagram. The bottom right is that same diagram as a dependency graph. Uh, okay. So uh, also on the request path diagram, we can use this as a gateway to select uh, traces. So if we look for traces that have BCF in their uh, makeup, and like that path, then we're gonna get a list of results and we can kind of dig into those or whatever we wanna do with them. Um, so the main thing here is uh, for each of these things that I've discussed, we can also do the flip side. And the bottom line is we can actually do even more than that because we can use any aspect of our current view as a criteria to filter traces and generate a new view. So if we're going from a Gantt chart to a comparison of one versus many, we might be interested in comparing this, this Gantt, the trace that we have a Gantt chart against our, an aggregate of traces that uh, demonstrate particular aspects that we're interested in in the current trace. Or if we're going from a request path graph to a Gantt chart, we can select that one path and say, find me traces that have this, and then we can dig into those. So we can kind of float and flow between these different views. And what that ends up giving us is, um, oh, I forgot another section. So also, so they have these different views that can affect each other, and they kind of have different contexts and implications and that kind of stuff. And so we can combine them in a, in a single tool. So here we have a trace graph and we're showing uh, tracing scores on it. So it's a good way to find out what, what uh, you know, the service has a low score so we can zoom into this particular node and look at what's going on there. 
or here we have a Gantt chart and we're looking at a latency histogram and there's a highlight for this span for where it fits into our latency histogram. Um, here's, uh, this is a path, uh, a tool called Pathfinder by, uh, I think it's University of Utah, uh, a team called CaliDo makes uh, this tool, which I find kind of fascinating. On the left, we have a list of paths and we can filter that. There's some criteria and capabilities to filter. I took that out. But basically we have a list of paths and then we have a topology graph or a node link diagram generated from that set of paths. And then we have uh, attribute aggregations on the right showing us sort of what we're looking at from a different perspective. So it's kind of the trifecta. Um, a lot of people like, like are initially very turned off by this, but uh, when I explained it to them, they're like, like somebody actually told me this is the Holy Grail. So, I mean, I guess uh, initially it's kind of overwhelming, but um, it, the multiple modality of it uh, has a lot of promise, I think. So because we can transition from one form of analysis to another really easily, what that means is we can use a diverse set of analysis techniques for any given task. And that's really kind of how we can harden our, our efforts. So for performance analysis, we might start with a latency histogram, select a few traces or select some subregion, compare the subregions, compare the traces, that kind of stuff, drill into the Gantt chart and really get down to what's going on. And then from there, we can go look at code or, or potentially uh, maybe isolate logs, that kind of thing. Uh, for instance, response, our number one kind of question anytime we're having an outage is what changed? So we can use a lot of comparisons for that. And these comparisons can then lead us to looking at individual traces for the same purpose of drilling down further. Um, for system comprehension, we can use a lot of attribute aggregations. This is calling out the trace quality score, but there's quite a few options there. We can also use the request path graph and the dependency graph to understand service dependencies, dependencies between tiers. So if you have like a tier zero that's calling like a tier three, often it's kind of some concern. And also dependencies between organizations. We can also look at calls between data centers that maybe we don't want to happen, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, so, um, so there's kind of a lot of stuff and it seems like a lot of work and I would say that from my experience it is, uh, but on the bright side, uh, it's worth it because we can benefit from incremental gains. So um, even adding just one form of additional analysis uh, can have a significant impact. We created that compare one versus compare many tool, which was a new mode of analysis at Uber and it really resonated with people. So we can go through some quotes. I kind of you know, feel a little weird about having some quotes on here. It's kind of like testimonials. But uh, the point is like this really resonated with people. Most of these quotes are from when it was in beta. Somebody let us know that everybody loves the tool. Uh, somebody else said like good neighbor, the tool is there. Somebody else said um, the tool is used by a team to quickly pinpoint upstream errors. This person was initially shocked uh, by the efficacy relative to Grafana dashboards. And then I realized this is the new normal for us. So this tool is in beta and this is kind of insane. Um, I've, you know, I've built a variety of internal tools and it's really great to read about this. I've worked on the front end for this tool. And, um, and so it's also kind of insane. I, I think this speaks to the richness of the distributed data set, uh, distributed tracing data set, and also the, the significance of adding new modes of analysis. So now we have compare one versus compare many, and that really resonated with people as uh, another way of looking at the data that wasn't available before. Uh, my favorite is a place where traces flow like wine and the on calls instinctively flock like the salmon of Capistrano, a little place called the tool. I've, I've left the name out because one of the key people working on it, uh, the, one of the, he kind of had a, a really important insight that really kind of unlocked a lot of stuff and he hasn't really talked about it. So I don't want to kind of debut it. So I'm kind of being a little uh, abstract here. But uh, bottom line is um, if we're not using the traces we collect, we're kind of like going to work, putting in our time and we're not cashing our check. And that, that's kind of unfortunate because we're out time and effort and we're also out the, the payoff, like we're not cashing our check. So uh, we can employ a variety of analysis techniques. We don't need to really go too crazy with them or anything. Like these are kind of like straightforward analysis techniques that we're working on at Uber and on Jaeger. Um, and also we can use more than one form of analysis because they kind of flow through each other pretty easily. And then when we use more than one for any given task, it kind of like benefits a task. Uh, kind of maybe we can say it has a really good kind of like, uh, I don't want to say synergistic effect, but um, they really kind of build on each other very well. And then lastly, uh, even adding just one new form of analysis can make a big difference. Adding like another way of doing something we're already doing, not necessarily as beneficial, but changing the way that people can do something is, is really powerful. And then uh, finally, if you're not using your traces, uh, then this is potentially an uh, area for massive impact. So thank you.